One of the most important things about Jura Unbound is that we celebrate what people do around the rest of the year, because what we do in August is dead easy, because everyone wants to come in August, because it's cool. Uh, but during the rest of the year, people do lots of brilliant stuff around music and literature and uh, kind of developing stuff, grassroots things around Edinburgh. So part of what we want to do here is celebrate what people do. And uh, one of those people is Born to be Wide. Uh, they did a great uh, event last year. Oh, I said last night. Last year. Uh, please welcome the, the man, the host, the founder, the man sporting possibly the festival's best trousers of the year so far, uh, Mr. Olaf Furness. Thanks very much, Roland. Um, welcome. For those of you who haven't been to Born to Be Wide Night, it started off 11 years ago to bring the Edinburgh music scene together. We invited people to play their favorite records unless they were by the Smiths or Joy Division. And um, it's kind of morphed into this uh, music event empire. And uh, this is uh, for the festival, our mothership. So, uh, I've got my first guest, um, Wyndham Wallace, a very old friend of who I first encountered in 1998 when I believe he was still sleeping in a converted garage. And um, he's written this fantastic book. So, Wyndham, where are you? Are you I thought you were holding out. Come on, a big round of applause for Wyndham, please. I thought you were, you were refusing to come on until your beer was brought for you. No, I was just waiting for your hair to like, ah, settle okay. down. God, you'll wait a long time for that, my <laughs> friend. Um, so, how many of you in this room have heard of Lee Hazelwood? Okay, so about half, um, an enthusiastic half. Um, I think then maybe what we need to do is give a bit of explanation because I'm sure that everyone in the room has heard Lee Hazelwood music. In fact, I know you have because that's what we are playing when you came in. But um, we should really maybe give the audience a bit of background on the man. Um, yeah, uh, well, Lee Hazelwood is probably best known for not being uh, terribly well known. Um, he... If, if people know him, they, they tend to recognize him as the person who wrote These Boots Are Made For Walking and many of the biggest hits of uh, Nancy Sinatra in the 60s, which also includes the likes of Summer Wine and Sand and Some Velvet Morning. Um, but, but what a lot of people don't know about Lee was that uh, his career uh, actually began much, much earlier with that uh, than that um, working with the likes of people like Sanford Clark and rather more well-known Dwayne Eddy, with whom he invented the twang, that uh, guitar sound played on the low uh, strings of the guitar, like Eddie Dushin used to play on the piano. And obviously the twang kind of helped shape the sound of rock and roll for many years. And then he also uh, wrote a large number of his own, uh, you know, recorded a large number of his own solo records, which uh, were largely ignored by pretty much every single person that ever heard them at the time. Uh, he also was the first person to give Phil Spector a job. And uh, as a producer, which was one of the many things that Lee did, uh, Lee created a sound which I think, if you're a fan of Phil Spector, you'll be very familiar with, um, which is kind of entertaining since Phil Spector was an intern for Lee Hazelwood. Um, so yeah, Lee, Lee has been uh, very much neglected, but he's a man who has really, really helped shape the, uh, the sound of, uh, of music as we, we know it today. And what kind of bands or artists over the years have, have covered his songs? Uh, all sorts of people. I mean, from B.B. King and Diana Ross to uh, Primal Scream and Kate Moss. Uh, Megadeth did a version of These Boots Are Made For Walking, which uh, Lee then sued them for, for um, ruining the lyrics. Um, <sighs> Nick Cave, uh, Richard Hawley, uh, Einsturz under Neubauten. I mean, countless wow. artists. I can tell you've been living in Berlin. You've perfected the, the accent. Uh, Wyndham lives in Berlin these days. Um, so you kind of came, um, you came about Lee Hazelwood in a, in a rather sort of interesting way. I mean, I believe it started when you visited London as a, as a student journalist. And yeah, I was, uh, I was at Exeter University, as you can probably tell from my accent. That's the kind of place I used to love hanging out. Um, and... Um, I was the uh, editor of the student magazine and, and I wrote a lot of the music reviews with a friend called Drew Pierce, who has actually gone on to be the guy who wrote Iron Man 3. Um, 
And Drew and I thought it would be a good idea to head up to London um, to go and meet a large number of the publicists who were kind enough to send us free records and give us guest tickets. And I, I thought this might be quite a smart way of, of sort of getting my foot in the door in the hope of eventually working in the music industry. And um, the very first meeting we ever had was with um, a gentleman called James Endicott, who was the publicist at Rough Trade Records at the time. And James uh, potted out from the, uh, the Rough Trade uh, Records office on the other side of the road to the little Greasy Spoon Cafe where we were, and he brought a copy of the Tinderstick 7-inch called A Marriage Made in Heaven. And on the cover of this 7-inch this was a, a picture of this grizzled old cowboy with this extraordinary moustache. And I just, I was completely haunted by this picture, but I had no idea who he was. And then the next night, I uh, went out with Drew to go and see um, Mark Eitzel from American Music Club, and I ended up um, having rather a large number of beers with a band called The Rocking Birds. Um, and uh, yeah, that then led to uh, uh, the discovery of Lee's music. So I think this is probably... Uh for many of you, it will be a very unconventional way of uh, discovering a, a band and or an artist. Um, I think we've got a bit of musical accompaniment. So Wyndham, in a in a legal sense, let's say, um, is going to recreate the the moment he first. Uh, first encountered the music of Lee Hazelwood. This is the day, by the way, after he saw this photograph of him for the first time. So and, and you, happened in two yeah, days. And you, need, you need to be aware that I'm, I'm at this point sitting in a, in a very, very scuzzy uh, Camden flat um, and I'm, I'm already very, very drunk. And uh, one of the members of the, uh, the Rocking Birds has passed me um, a <laughs> very, very sizable joint, um, which I am by the point that the, the book I'm about to read, this joint is really starting to kick in. My head tips back against the headrests as the cannabis dances with the night's alcohol. I stare up at the ceiling where there's further discoloration spoiling what was once elaborate stucco. Closing my eyes and opening my ears seems preferable to facing my surroundings, and soon I find myself listening to a country song delivered in a voice as dark as the night outside. A tale of prison, of convicts who checked out in a casket, the rhythm beaten out by the chip of hammer on stone. After a while, I recognize in it a curious comic absurdity, the hint of a hick accent in the voice increasingly ludicrous as, much like Travis Bickle committing to getting organized, he laments his 10,000 more breakfasts to go. Then, without warning, the tone shifts disarmingly to tender thoughts of mama. Perhaps it's the drugs, but I've never heard anything quite like this. In the past, I've winced at Jolene and cringed at Smokey and the Bandit. I've been tortured by Kenny Rogers and endured American Pie. If forced, I'll admit to having liked the Dukes of Hazard, but that theme tune with a banjo that sounds like a plucked elastic band is really best forgotten. As for Achy Breaky Heart and its mulleted immortality, it's done no one but Billy Ray Cyrus any favors. And where I come from, unless they mean hunting horns, that's what they call country music. This song, though, is something else. This song is rhinestone free. I need to ask who it is, but as so often, I don't dare appear unsophisticated. The music industry, the last 48 hours have warned me, is full of people trying to flaunt their knowledge while monitoring its lack in others. So I keep my mouth shut, and as the cello brings the song to a sedate conclusion, I slide further into my wrecked armchair. And the record snaps, crackles, and pops. A softly plucked guitar opens the next tune, a simple arpeggio that rolls by four times before the voice is back, lazy, seemingly as stoned as I now feel, echoing as though floating along damp granite corridors from a far-off prison cell. Leather and lace, it intones, all distant and cavernous, hanging in place, now soft and loving, and the fire was as warm as the wine. A drowsy oboe awakes, stirring the mist to rouse a solitary chord played on the strings of virgin white violins. Things are definitely better with my eyes closed. The leather was hot, it continues. The lace it was not, impossibly slowly. So she left my side for a time. Leather and lace hanging in place And the fire was as warm as the wine The 
The pace picks up, the tune sweet enough for Little House on the Prairie, though its lyrics, sung with relish, dragging just behind the beat, suggest otherwise. Now the leather lace still hangs in place, but I never see her anymore. A female voice takes over, so sultry and indecently sexy that it tickles the hair on the back of my neck and almost makes me cross my legs. The strings are like veins swelling with blood, slowly at first, then increasingly uninhibited. A hint of horn and a tease of oboe are bare skin, the melody floating over its surface. But I never see him anymore The song shifts up a key and I gasp It's like we've reached the peak of a mountain and we've discovered hidden hillsides and dark unknown forests I'm entering Freudian territory Man, I really am stoned The male lasciviously takes the lead but the melody is swiftly snatched back by his foil a suggestive Scandinavian cadence nudging at the edge of her delivery. He grabs the song from her impatiently. Saliva smacks in his mouth. Her again, proud, self-deluding. Him, sad but velvet smooth. She throws a hand to her brow. Her lip quivers. I could almost smell the regret. Now the leather and the lace Him again. Still hangs in place. Defiant that he never needed more anyway. Her, one last time. Regret now undeniable, as clear as her eyes are swollen. Almost imperceptibly, there's a final sigh from the cowboy. Whether it's resigned or satisfied is hard to say. Next, the flutter of a heart. This time it's the strings. And last, a chord that spreads and fades like a single drop of sweat on a shadowy silken sheet, almost invisible, then gone. This is the best fucking joint of my life. Wow. Cannabis is a gateway to authorship and uh, music management. When was this? This was, what, 1994 when you had this yeah, that um, was, epiphany? Uh, actually, I think it was 1992. And I spent most of the next uh, six or seven years um, doing everything I could to try and get hold of anything that Lee Hazel had been involved with, which was tremendously hard because most of his records were out of print. Um, I think the only legitimate record I managed to get hold of was a compilation of uh, work he'd done with Nancy Sinatra under the name Fairy Tales and um, yeah, Fantasies and Fairy Tales. And I would, I'd go on holiday to America when I started working in the music industry as a publicist. I'd go on holiday, I'd go somewhere like San Francisco and I'd plot all my sightseeing as, as a sad, lonely man from thrift store to thrift store, occasionally popping in on a church or an art gallery. But basically all I wanted to do was find anything that had Lee Hazelwood's name on it. And then, yeah, in 1999, I found myself uh, backstage at a Sonic Youth show, which I always loved being able to say. Um, and I overheard Steve Shelley, the drummer, talking about Lee Hazelwood. And um, I was working at the time as a, as a freelance publicist. And uh, so I kind of edged into the conversation and said I was a huge fan. And he said that he was actually talking to Lee and was going to be hopefully reissuing some of his records. And this to me was pretty remarkable since the only things I'd heard were that Lee was either dead or he was a monk. Um, <laughs> And so I offered myself as a publicist, and a few months later, I got the job. And you then had a meeting with him. This is your, your first meeting with him in, in New York, in, a, in some kind of uh, sterile hotel, if I 
remember. Oh, it, was the, it was the Grand Hyatt, but you know. Sterile enough, I guess, by your standards. What happened? I mean, you went in there, you're, you're actually, what, in your mid-20s? I think I was, turned up. Up. Yeah, I was 27 years old, and at the time I was living in a converted garage in Brixton. And I'd get woken up in the middle of the night by the sound of men pissing, like, just the other side of the door. Um, and yeah, I, was, I, I flew over to New York to have this meeting with him because I decided it would be really smart to persuade him to perform live again. And what I didn't know was that he'd actually never, ever performed live in Britain as a solo artist. And uh, luckily, I talked uh, Nick Cave and the, the Royal Festival Hall people into to booking him for the, um, for the Meltdown Festival in 1999. So yeah, I flew over to meet him and uh, have this meeting to discuss the upcoming promotion and the show. And uh, all he wanted to do was get thoroughly drunk, uh, drinking whiskey. I was so nervous, I started smoking again for the first time in two years. And his, and his first words to me, when he, look, he just looked me up and down and he just went, how the fuck old are you, 13? <laughs> <laughs> and it all went downhill from there. So the, the whole process, you, you were working as a, as a publicist and suddenly you find yourself bringing this cantankerous um, old musician over uh, London. You don't know if it's going to work out or not. He's holding out for the money. His, his girlfriend's involved as well in this, uh, in this elaborate elaborate plot. I mean, how, um, how did you pull it off? Pure luck and persistence and idiocy, I think. Um, I don't know, for some bizarre reason, Lee took a shine to me. Um, I think he was so completely baffled that somebody called Wyndham Wallace, uh, <laughs> who spoke in this really posh Southern Counties accent and whose father was, uh, was a general, um, <laughs> I think he was utterly baffled as to how the hell I could you know, possibly be interested in him. And I was absolutely baffled as how he could be interested in me. And, and yeah, this, this actually slowly led to this sort of weird development of, of, of our relationship. So I started out as his publicist and I became, he actually called me an executive producer of two records. Um, and then- What does that mean? Uh, it means he gave me 24 demos and I decided 12 of them were absolutely crap and could I use the other 12 to release as a record? And then I put them in order. And I took the song called um, POA or BJ for my birthday and I hid that at the end because I thought it was a bit puerile having a song which was basically about, um, sorry, Blue Jaguars, BJ, and POA apparently stood for a pear or apple. I want a POA or a BJ for my birthday. So I hid that at the end. That's what an executive producer does. It's quite easy. And how did the, the relationship develop then over the years? Well, I, obviously the book tells a little bit of that story. I mean, the book is actually divided into two halves. It's the first six months or so that I knew him, and then it's the, the last 18 months that I knew him. And it doesn't really cover huge amounts in between, but I, I worked with him on these two records that we released on City Slang, and then um, my own personal life kind of uh, collapsed a little bit when my UK business partner hanged himself, having spent all our money. Um, and I, uh, I moved to Berlin, and I kind of lost contact with Lee a little bit for a few months, and then uh, he announced he was making a new record and uh, asked if I would um, remain involved. The kind of sweet thing was he wrote me this fax which just said, where have you gone? I miss you, or something like that. And uh, so yeah, I ended up getting involved with that, that record, at which point he gave me a call and said, well, I don't know if this is ever gonna mean anything to you, but if you wanna put this on your letterheads or your business cards or whatever the fuck you use, you can call yourself uh, manager, brackets, Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you mentioned these faxes and they, they come up quite a lot in the book because it was, I suppose, email existed, but I guess he wasn't using email too much. He wasn't actually using faxes. He was getting his, his, his future wife to write them. And often she would like scribble little notes in there as well. Lee told me to write that um, to sort of protect herself from some of the meaner things that were being <laughs> written in the, they, they, they were known as hate faxes, a lot of them. And I think that this is, uh, you know, clearly he, you managed to get him to do one interview first as his publicist because he was reluctant to, to speak to any journalists. And um, you, you told me that he ended up doing quite a lot of um, interviews. So you must have um, had, a, had a good influence on him in that respect. But I think that there's some of these, uh, there's a facts here that I think be worth reading out. because it got the whole thing? Um, yeah. Was, okay. Well, this was after he'd uh, he'd 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 done a piece for Mojo, and he was a little bit upset about the the some of the content of it because they'd spoken to other people apart from Lee, um, and had got one fact wrong. And this this fact was actually before I'd ever any, had any contact with him, and it was sent to Steve Shelley, and it just went. Um, Remember, as you read this, it's not about you. 
It's about your PR firm, and I hope it's not about them. It's most probably about that fucking Brit rag, Mojo. So what is it with these people? Don't they know how much I dislike interviews? Not quite as much as I hate interviewers. They have the balls to tell me they'll only give us one or two pages if I do the interview on the phone, but they'll give us five or six pages if I let some northern frozen-ass writer have a three-day vacation in sunny Florida so he can talk to my swollen face. I get penalized 75% if I don't do the interview in person. Tell Mojo to pee off. Piss off. That's about 75%, huh? Uh, okay, I'm only doing this for you, and here are my rules. Tell them to send someone who has heard of me, not some frozen-ass northern writer who thinks I'm Captain Hazelwood of the ship Valdez that spilled half the oil in Alaska and killed off the fish and the animals. 75% of the interview will be about the new CD and the re-releases. I'll spend all the time they want talking about my songs, hits or no hits, but no time talking about the bunch of old loser artists who sell no records today and never will again that I produced in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s or 90s. So tell them to send that frozen-ass northern writer on down to Florida for a three-day vacation. I won't take up much of his time, especially if he starts asking the wrong questions. <laughs> that was a good one. There were much nastier ones. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have to stress that the, the Hazelwood is spell H-A-Z-L-E rather than Z-E-L, and that, that a few years later um, resulted in a, in a funny incident, didn't it, when you were in Berlin? Yeah, he'd, he'd come over to record a song with a, with a big indie rock artist called Bela B um, from a band called Die Adster. And uh, the, the very, very first time they met, we, were, uh, we, we went to this uh, steak restaurant um, just off Friedrichstrasse. And I noticed this, this group of people sitting on the table next door to us, and I, I couldn't help overhearing their conversation. And Lee was very busy just talking to Bela and Bela's manager. But eventually I was kind of forced to sort of lean over to the table next door and say, um, excuse me, um, you're not talking about Lee Hazelwood, are you? And they said, yeah, we are. Yeah, we, we're opening a cafe called Hazelwood. I was like, okay, well, this is kind of weird because this is actually Lee Hazelwood here. And I, yeah, we thought it might be. And so I was like, Lee, you're not going to believe this. So they showed him the plans for their new cafe. But they spelled it H-A-Z-E-L <laughs> instead of L-E. And Lee just took one look at this and it just turned his back on them and ignored them for the whole of the rest of the evening. I don't think they even finished their dessert before they left. <laughs> and I mean, there's one of the things that comes out in the book was that he could be incredibly caustic and you, you are at the receiving end of this um, quite a lot of the time. And I think that there's, there is that kind of... Um, I suppose this this balance where some of the time he's he's got this incredible generosity and then some of the time he's incredibly mean. Um, where you're not tempted to just walk away at any of these points. Uh, yeah, I mean, he once sacked me for having a migraine. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I was, but I mean, I was bullied at school, so I was used to it. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's like that, that guy who was uh, kidnapped in the Middle East and, uh, you know, he came out after, was it John McCarthy? He came out after about seven years and they said, how did you survive? He's like, well, I was at boarding school. I got used to it. Yeah. <laughs> I was sent away to boarding school at the age of eight. Lee Hazelwood was nothing compared to the molesting teachers and, you know, all that kind of stuff that I faced. But I have to, just to, just to interrupt, I have to say that is why I decided to write the book the way I did rather than as a straight biography because, um, to me, the absolute fascination of Lee was the fact that he was such a cantankerous, miserable old be uh, git at times and, and then just an utterly beautiful, charming, fabulous father figure. And uh, I thought that was going to be a hell of a lot more interesting for people to read, you know, to, to learn of my experiences of him. Because right? I got to know him so incredibly well. You know, I was there watching him pretty much die in the last, uh, you know, year and a half of his life. And um, plus it would be a hell of a lot easier to write that than spend, you know, three years trying to write a bi biography and find out the facts, which... Um, even Lee didn't know. One of the things that did occur to me, occur to me was the fact that you seem to have uh, re reproduced this dialogue from 15 years before, um, almost verbatim. And I, I was a bit suspicious about that. Um, but later on, you, you explain how that, actual, how that dialogue came about. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a brilliant memory. Um, that is nothing to do with the abuse of weed. Um, I uh, did spend a lot of time when I was hanging out with Lee uh, doing interviews with him. I'd done interviews uh, for the two records that I'd released in the, the early 2000s. And um, even up to the, to the, you know, like, I think the last time I saw him was three weeks before he died. And I spent two days 
with him, like he was just this cadaverous figure lying on the sofa in this dark sitting room in his house in Las Vegas. And uh, he made a list of all the famous people who he'd met. And uh, the original plan was that I would record him telling these anecdotes. Um, but unfortunately, by this point, his, his mind was, was a bit befuddled by all the drugs that he was on for his uh, kidney cancer. And he, so he didn't tell the stories as well as he might have done. And he sometimes got facts wrong, but because he had a habit of telling stories, I knew them all pretty much off by heart. And so I was able to use these, a lot of these recordings of interviews like that and interviews that I'd done previously for it, during the course of the book dropped into various scenes because I knew he told those stories at various points. If he hadn't told that exact story about meeting Bjorn Borg's dad or Roger Moore on a yacht, he definitely told me that story at some point, at least once or twice. I should add that the name of the book that he wanted me to, to write made of these little anecdotes was going to be um, Famous People I Have Met. Most of them are dead. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, myself, and I's pretty good as well, though, so I think you could... Uh... Well, it's, cause, it's because most of the book's about me. <laughs> <laughs> I get to do the two things I like most of all, talk about Lee Hayeswood and talk about myself. So, Are there any sort of plans for a film or a documentary? Actually, I, I, I do really, really want to make a documentary. Um, I, I've been approached about that, but I haven't uh, spoken to this particular guy because I have a... He, he spent a lot of time in the 70s living in Sweden. And that, to me, is like the, the crucial period in his life when he made the very best records of his life. And I'd really like to do a documentary based around that period, looking back at what he did earlier in his life and then looking forward to the comeback. And I have access to the most incredible amount of footage and tape recordings from that era. So, um, yeah, I would love there to be a documentary. Two people have tried to make documentaries, but they've never actually um, come to fruition. The time is right. Well, hopefully uh, that's going to happen soon. And um, in the meantime, Wyndham's book, A Mighty Fine Read. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Wyndham Wallace. Thank you very much indeed.